China, a country the size of Europe, with every kind of landscape. Every kind of habitat. Every kind of climate. And where animals of many different types rare, exquisite, and endangered, live in unique ecosystems, in remote isolation, and alongside people. But today, both these habitats and the extraordinary species who live within them are increasingly faced with challenges. As people race to find solutions, to preserve China's wild beauty. China's vast wetlands, found in every corner of the country, in all terrains, from plain to plateau, coastal regions to inland areas, in temperate and tropical zones, near the summit of mountains, and even in caves carved out below the Earth's surface. Each body of water varies wildly in character. Some are permanent, others seasonal. Some found inland, while others are along the coast and battered by the tides. But these varied and wonderful wetlands together make up one of the most biologically diverse of China's ecosystems rich in extraordinary species, aquatic and terrestrial, and plants that have specially adapted to unique soils and fluctuating water levels. The wetlands provide livelihoods for millions of people in China living along the banks and shores, and they also protect them from natural disaster with floodplains, and they halt the effects of climate change through peatlands that absorb and store carbon. And so the value of the wetland system is immeasurable for China's wildlife and for its human population. The mighty Yangtze, Asia's longest river, courses only through China from the Tibetan Plateau to Shanghai. And along the fertile banks of its wetlands and floodplains, over the course of Chinese history, the civilization's most important kingdoms, cities, and culture have flourished. Today, its middle and lower reaches are home to China's most developed economies. But as people flourish, some species unique to this region are teetering on the brink of extinction. Recently, the whole Yangtze River Basin has been given special environmental status with a high standard of protection. But this may have come too late for some species. This Yangtze porpoise, like its cousins, the dolphins and whales, is a carnivore.
He is a finless porpoise with no dorsal fin, but found only in the wild in the Yangtze River, he's better known as the Yangtze mermaid and renowned for his mischievous smile. But he and his species have very little to smile about. There are fewer than a thousand left in the wild and without help, he faces extinction within 10 to 15 years. Scientists are racing against the clock to protect this ancient aquatic mammal. By studying a limited number of specimens, they hope to learn more about this porpoise and his family. and how to save them. The more they know, the better they can protect the entire species and prevent it from vanishing. Freshwater species around the world are declining much faster than their land or sea counterparts. An 80% drop in their populations has taken place in the past 50 years and the survival of this species could now rest on a close contact study of our porpoise and his friends. Everything they do is recorded and assessed. The experts here are building up the fullest picture yet of how these mammals behave and respond in various situations. They are also in peak physical condition, primed to breed and produce the healthiest offspring possible. This group, or pod of porpoises, is made up of males and females. The female finless porpoise, like all porpoises, are larger in build than the males. And they can carry a single calf every other year. They have a level of intelligence comparable to a gorilla. They're one of the smartest animals. They seem cooperative and keen to communicate with their handlers, as if helping them out in their research efforts. Other initiatives are also underway to boost numbers in the wild. This is Tiena Zhou Oxbow in Hubei province. Formed just 40 years ago, when a wide meander from the main stem of the Yangtze River was naturally cut off, creating this freestanding body of water. And now, it's home to a select few members of this critically endangered species. They were not naturally marooned here when the lake was first formed, but are part of an ambitious and highly successful breeding program. It all started 30 years ago when five injured porpoises were found in the Yangtze. They were nursed back to health, but instead of being returned to the river and subject to numerous dangers, they were relocated to a new home, this Oxbow Lake. And today, those founding five members have multiplied into a pod of over 60. About 10 calves are born here every year. The porpoises are flourishing here, but the story in the main flow of the Yangtze couldn't be more different. Many don't make it to sexual maturity, aged five, and so numbers are decreasing at a rapid rate. Each year during the rainy season, this oxbow lake used to reconnect with the Yangtze. And so to prevent seasonal flooding, a dike was built. This also had the added benefit of containing the Yangtze porpoise within the safe confines of the lake, where the marine biologists are able to protect them from the dangers and uncertain future that lies beyond. 
The ultimate aim for these relocated porpoises is to return them to their river. But this will have to wait until a time when the conditions along the entire stretch of the river, beyond the lake, and even in the farmer's fields, are more favourable for their existence. Today, 20 kilometres of the river is also a designated nature reserve. Closed to the public for the protection of the species and to boost fish supplies in the general area. In the Yangtze, these porpoises struggle to find food as a result of overfishing in the area. But the only boats seen here are patrolling the fish supplies. There are no trawlers. In the lake and the nature reserve, the food supply couldn't be better. As every year, large amounts of fish larvae are released into the river system here to maintain a rich resource of fish. This method of conservation is unprecedented. It's a world first, but one that is already proving highly effective in the fight to prevent the species from becoming extinct. The transition for these animals has been seamless. They love it here. But the locals have also had to adapt to a new way of living. Ding Zuliang was a fisherman. But today, he no longer competes for fish with the porpoises, but delivers fish to them. He retired from fishing after strict quotas were imposed in the area, and now uses his knowledge of these waters and the fish for a better purpose. He tenderly looks after the newest arrivals in the lake, helping mothers and their calves with the early stages of life. He feeds a a, a female, and her calf every four hours with fish caught sustainably in the Tian Er Zhou Oxbow Lake. And this keeps him very busy, as they can consume five kilograms of fish a day, about 10% of their body weight. Porpoises can swim at great depths, but like a a, they choose to feed towards the surface. It's early winter. Uh, uh, and her infant bob happily to the surface of the water, snatching food. He is her first baby and is seven months old now, and only recently weaned off his mother's milk. He doesn't yet know how to hunt. He'll start in the coming months using echolocation, a method of understanding his environment through sound and echo. But these are all skills that he can take his time to grasp as life in the Oxbow Lake is comfortable and safe. And with this regular delivery service, neither of them seem in any hurry to fend for themselves. Further along the river, in the lower reaches of the Yangtze, one impressive wetland species has been brought back from the brink of extinction. The Milu deer. In the late 19th century, the world's only herd of this majestic species belonged to the Qing Dynasty Emperor Tong Zhu. But a series of disasters, flooding and war, entirely wiped out China's native population. Then in 1985, 22 milu living in zoos and wildlife parks in the UK were given to nature reserves in China. And so the milu deer was brought back to its homeland 
and placed in cordoned off nature reserves and breeding centers around wetland areas. But the Milu's fascinating story doesn't end here. In 1998, a flood at a breeding center caused 30 deer to flee for their lives. And they settled here, on the lower reaches of the Yangtze's wetlands, where they've thrived and multiplied. It's estimated that there might be up to 1,000 milu living here in the wild. In effect, this colony reintroduced itself back into the wild. It's December and the shortest day in the year. The sun rises over a milu protected zone on the edge of a willow forest. This group roams silently across the mud flats. Usually segregated by sex, the males are at the front and the harem of females follow. Their broad hooves are perfect for muddy terrain. Their coat is a reddish tan in the summer, but it's changed to a dull gray now that winter's here. This change of color serves a useful purpose. It helps camouflage the milu when the winter mists arrive. These deer swim well, spending long periods standing in water up to their shoulders. They're mainly grazers, but supplement their grassy diet with aquatic plants in the summer. It's the autumn rut, or mating season. When bulls fight each other for the mating rights to entire groups of females, Groups of male milu, called bucks or stags, roam their land and adorn themselves with bracken and grass. They want to look bigger and more intimidating than their rivals. In a muddy puddle, they engage in a flamboyant act called bellowing throwing back their heads to roar and showing off their thick necks. They smear mud on their chest and legs, blackening their fur. And then they bugle, making a high-pitched whistling noise to warn off potential competition. Their antlers are specifically grown to enhance sexual attraction and to be used as weapons in fights over interested females and even for control of entire harems. It's winter now and most of the female milu are pregnant. So the antlers have done their job and promptly snap off. They will grow back again soon and grow at a faster rate than any other mammal bone, finished off with a thin layer of velvet. The muddy ground is strewn with buck's antlers. This is a busy time for the rangers working here who collect them all. But equipped with only boots rather than hooves, they're finding the wetland terrain a bit of a challenge. They want to get a handle on the size and age of the population they look after. And they can learn lots from these antlers. Older stags have more branches, with up to 16 points. More than 1,600 kilometers away in South China's Hainan province is a coastal wetland and large mangrove forest. Dong Jai Gang. Here, all life is affected by the tides. The 
water rises and falls on a daily basis, alternately flooding the land and then retreating. The seawater is heavy with salt. But each type of mangrove growing on these swampy shores has responded to the challenges in their own surprising way. This is the Bruguera gymnoriza, a black mangrove. Its eerie roots protrude above the ground. There is no oxygen in the mud, so its roots grow above the surface and breathe through pores. Taking in oxygen from the air and then transmitting it way below the surface to the mangrove's deeper roots. The stilted mangrove in this forest is positioned on the front line, closest to the coast. To deal with the impact of waves and the force of the tide, this stilted mangrove grows lots of tall spindly roots around a central trunk. These make it more sturdy, buttressing the vital central trunk. It stands tall and firm on this muddy bank. And not far from the shore, the Aegiserus corniculatum, or river mangrove, a type of red tree, has evolved to secrete salt through a complex filtering system that has been acquired over millions of years. They can discharge surplus salt from their body via salt glands on the leaves. Mangroves are engineered like no other species on Earth, and they have a role to play in our survival too trapping climate-changing carbon emissions and protecting coastal areas from erosion. But the mangroves here also support a vast ecosystem. Living amongst the mesh of mangrove roots, hidden from almost everyone and everything, are some truly exceptional and unique semi-aquatic species. Egrets are circling above the mangrove's canopy, They're looking for food, but most importantly, they're playing a waiting game. The tide has gone out, exposing some of their favourite snacks. Who are now slithering through the mud and scuttling out of burrows in search of their own food now that the waters have gone. Low tide is mealtime for most of the creatures living in this mangrove forest. This sea slug has set his sights on some vegetation. These male and female fiddler crabs shovel sand into their mouths using a hypnotic rhythm and a style that resembles that of a fiddler on a bow, hence the name. But the couple aren't actually eating sand. They're feasting on microscopic organisms and microbes living amongst the tiny grains of sand. They spit the excess sand back out and roll it into balls. Some experts believe that the feeding habits of the fiddler crabs play a vital role in the preservation of wetland environments. Because as they sift through the grains, they aerate the dense, muddy sand. This couple share this one burrow, and housekeeping is the job of the female in this relationship. She rolls the excess sand that has been spat out away from their underground home. These crabs communicate by a series of unique waves, gestures and lunges. And there's nothing more expressive than the gesticulating of the male using his one oversized claw. He woos his partner 
by waving this oversized claw, indicating to her that he could build a good burrow for her to incubate her eggs in. He also uses this claw to defend her and their burrow. And incredibly, if he loses this claw in battle, another will grow from the opposite side. The crab's shell can transform in many remarkable ways. In the day, it's dark, and towards the evening, it's brightly coloured. The tide is coming in. So there's only a short window left to feed. A mudskipper is looking for algae. He's an amphibious fish and something of an enigma. Equally skilled at swimming in water and slithering on land. Breathing through his skin only when wet and with the help of an enlarged gill where he traps a bubble of air when out of the water. But his most impressive trick is the high jump. This mud skipper has to be careful. Gymnastics like this are sure to attract unwanted attention. From the hungry birds hidden in the mangrove forest, circling above the mangrove's treetops and patrolling the muddy ground. He uses his large eyes to watch for activity overhead and quickly retreats into his burrow at the first sign of danger. The fiddler crabs also escape back to their burrows, but here these egrets have many other options to choose from. There's an abundance of food for all wading birds around these mangroves, enough to go around and share with their friends. And today, a visitor lands on these muddy shores, a foreigner washed up from the deep sea. This is the oldest marine creature on Earth, with a history of 300 million years. Chinese horseshoe crabs, also known as living fossils. This couple are in the process of breeding. The female has carried the male ashore on her back. And when the process is complete, she will lay her eggs in the sand. She lays up to 100,000 eggs in batches of a few thousand at a time. The eggs will take two weeks to hatch, so need to be well hidden from scavenger birds in the dense mangrove. Her baby's shells are initially very soft and need time to firm up. So she chooses to have them here, as the mud on the shore will protect them during their lengthy childhood. As the tide returns, These crabs are safe from aerial attacks from the egrets. 
but now they must be cautious of opportunistic predators from below. The Chinese Black Sleeper. It resides in the shallow waters around the roots of the mangrove trees. A preying fish found in both marine and fresh waters. During the high tide, its main source of nutrition are crabs. It's the start of another day in the mangrove forests. And those at the top of the food chain and the bottom feeders are all enjoying some respite from the dramas of the day. Feeding time is over for these birds, but only until the next low tide, when a hidden world emerges once more. These mangrove creatures are bound to a cycle of life and death, governed by the rhythm of the moon and waves. China's awe-inspiring and extensive cast landscapes where the humid climate and plentiful rainwater has been eroding the craggy limestone mountains for millions of years. The water seeping through the rock fissures gradually works its way into the depths of the mountain, creating limestone caverns. An extraordinary world of interlocked underground cavities, subterranean pools of water, and an incredible underground habitat for wildlife. The limestone caverns are inaccessible to most. They are defined by darkness, but they provide a refuge for some. Ancient creatures who've endured hundreds of millions of years of environmental changes creatures bizarre in appearance and behavior. And here, in the dark and dank conditions, they continue their evolution. Near the cave entrance, a giant salamander lurks at the bottom of the water. The largest amphibian in the world He's a relic from the dinosaur era and can grow up to two meters long. He's a carnivore and feeds off insects, millipedes, and even some other amphibians. He's a lazy hunter, lying motionless, camouflaged to look exactly like a rock, until the point when a passerby takes his fancy. Despite his apparently all-seeing, lidless, unblinking eyes, his eyesight is, in fact, very poor. 
Instead, he depends on a line of specialized sensory nodes that run from his head to his tail. These are so sensitive he can react to the slightest movement around him. And that's when he jumps into action, striking with speed. After eating a hearty meal, this giant salamander can go without food for two or even three years. These white filaments are sticky secretions. He can produce them at will to repel predators. And he sheds his skin every 10 to 15 days to stay healthy. No creature is better suited to life in the quiet calm of these caves, which provides this shy and solitary salamander with the isolation he craves. Water here has shaped this subterranean world and brought nutrients to the ecosystem. The salamander population has been in decline since the 1970s due to habitat loss and pollution of rivers. But the clear, calm and untouched waters of the limestone caverns provide a safe home for the giant Chinese salamander. It's autumn on Cao Hai Lake. a freshwater lake in southwest China's Guizhou province. This is a remote and mountainous province, and Cao Hai is what's known as a plateau lake, up on Weining Mountain. It's a hot destination for migratory birds. 184 bird species live around or visit the lake. Cao Hai means grass sea, and this name hints at how rich the lake is with aquatic plants. Add this to a mild climate, and it's not surprising that in early spring and late autumn, more than 100,000 birds will migrate here. open-bill stork, indigenous to India and Southeast Asia, is attracted to the abundance of food here in the grass sea. They are the largest wading bird in the area and are one of the top predators on the lake. And their hunting method is remarkable. They seem to be taking part in a ritualistic display dance. They flap their wings and they stamp their feet on the ground. In fact, they're coordinating their actions and hunting in a pack, trying to scare their prey out from their hideaways in the long grass. In late autumn, the grass sea receives its first visitors from the Tibetan Plateau. 
a flock of bar-headed geese. These are the highest flying birds on the planet. They've even been spotted flying over Mount Everest. When they land on the lake, it's easy to see the two distinctive black bars on their heads that give them their name. A flock of black-necked cranes is joining the thousands of birds already on Tsao Hai Lake. They're the only cranes to live on the plateau and will stay here for up to six months at a time. After such a long migration, these birds are still getting used to the swampy grounds of the wetlands. The black-necked cranes are attracted to the wetlands too. But they're also lured here by the opportunities offered in the rich farmland surrounding the lake. The birds are unfazed by the presence of humans. But it's a different story when they're confronted by a pair of domestic geese. Despite their greater height and size, the cranes seem confused by these aggressive farmyard birds and they're unsure how to respond. But the wetland is rich in small fish and shrimps. And thankfully, there's enough for everyone. These birds feast on the grass of the wetlands. whilst the migrating birds grow more adventurous, setting their sights on the unattended crops of the local farmers. They've long studied his schedule and execute their plan flawlessly. When the farmer has finished turning the soil, the cranes move in en masse. It's mating season. Much to the delight of farmers and local geese here. The cranes and other migratory birds head west to their breeding grounds on the Tibetan Plateau. Three thousand metres above sea level, Qinghai Lake 
China's largest saltwater lake, is still frozen. This lake is at a perfect crossroads for many migratory bird routes. With some stopping here temporarily, but many more staying here to breed. Over 100 freshwater rivers and streams flow into the lake. The fluctuating water levels expose new islands for the birds to settle on. The black-necked crane pair are territorial. They choose to construct their nest far from the other cranes. They build it from clumps of grass and algae they've collected from the shoreline. Cormorants form colonies during the breeding season. They return to the same site year after year. This world famous rock on the west side of the lake has belonged to the cormorants for as long as records go back. Cormorants laying their eggs in this exposed spot must cope with altitude, high winds, and plunging temperatures. But today, as one cormorant glides effortlessly above the Blue Lake, Qinghai looks like one of the most serene places on Earth. As well as being severely impacted by climate change, Wetlands are also an important part of the puzzle to protect against environmental damage. Wetlands act as a natural buffer against the most extreme events. Soaking up heavy rainfall, and regulating water flow to protect against floods. The wetlands are an essential border between two worlds, with a unique ecosystem of their own. From wild swampy marshes in eastern China, to cultivated rice paddies in the south and west, They're a home for mammals, crustaceans and birds alike. Providing nature's creatures with a source of clean drinking water, nutritious food and shelter on long migrations. Over the last century, 50% of the world's wetlands have vanished. And as mankind has taken from the wetlands, it's time for us to give back and rebuild. Every creature on Earth needs water to live. And where land meets water, there is more life than almost anywhere else on the planet.